I joined the Air Force originally, really just because it's something I always wanted to do. One of my stepbrothers was a Marine, and growing up, uh, he was like maybe 10, 10 years older than me, roughly. It always just kind of inspired me. Me and my other stepbrother were actually going to join together, but uh, he went off to college. I uh, kind of did my own thing, and finally decided enough was enough, so I joined. So I've been in the Air Force coming up to two years uh, next month. Um, I'm currently in Airman First Class or in E3. I though hopefully, if I find out next month as well, I actually may be going up for what's called BTZ or below the zone. What that means is you, if you've proven yourself to your leadership, as you know, doing your job right, you potentially can get promoted up to six months early. So hopefully by the time you watch this video, I'll be uh, E4 by then or senior Airman. So I am a C-17 crew chief, that is 2 Alpha 5 X-1. Um, X stands for uh, basically the different level you're at. So there's a 3 level, a 5 level, 7 level, and a 9 level. When you basically first get to your shop after uh, tech school, generally you're going to be a 3 level. In theory, you should be qualified on all the basic jobs which should allow you to go into the jet and do different things different things with it. Once you get them a five level, you're, you're basically out of that little blanket of, I didn't know what I was doing. So you, in theory, should have been there long enough to be able to say, hey, I know what I'm doing. Let me sign off all these jobs. Uh, seven level, obviously, you're, you're a lot more qualified. You can basically be a supervisor of most every kind of job that's going to be out there. You can sign off certain jobs that not everyone else can. When I joined, I did not want to be a crew chief. I joined wanting to be weather. Um, I had on my dream sheet of what jobs I would like to be as security forces, weather, cyber, linguist, and a few others. Whenever I originally went and did my the little test, I ended up getting like an 80, 87 or 88, uh, which in theory you are already qualified on almost every job in the Air Force. With that, I had no intentions of doing anything else and it was what I wanted to do. Yeah, that's what I wanted to, that's what I actually wanted to be whenever I joined. So getting to the other part of it, when did I find out what, uh, what job I was getting? About six months before I joined, so on Memorial Day specifically, me and my brother were playing football and uh, he got a little uh, too serious with his throw one time. I was going to catch the football, snap my finger back. So being the truthful airman I was, I decided to go tell the recruiter I had to go back to MEPS. The logic behind this, I'm still trying to figure out to this day, but they basically said, oh, your finger was broken. Whenever that heals, we don't know how well that's going to work when it comes to typing on a computer. How about, let's just put you in maintenance. Working with heavy machinery and moving parts and all this stuff, that's going to be a lot healthier for your finger than working on a computer. Ha! Got he! Got he! Ha! So no. Uh, still don't, but I am starting to appreciate the job. And that's probably a big key for anyone who does any kind of job, whether you're security forces, services, finance, really any job in the Air Force. Unless you're like a PJ where you're personally trying to get in there to do one of those jobs. I highly doubt it. it's anyone's dream job to sit out there and be a crew chief and be yelled at all the time. It is not something I wanted to do. I'm appreciating it more, but uh, that's just because it's kind of cool. I'm going on a plane that costs like 200 something 280 million dollars or something like that it's crazy to see this big hunk of metal i do still for the life of me cannot see how that thing lifts off the air i will listen to the air and uh see that thing go up and i'm saying wow i launched that jet or i did the inspection on this jet to help approve it to actually launch uh obviously i wanted to be a uh, being weather it was something, being from Texas, it's something I've always kind of been interested in because I was born and raised in Tornado Alley, so for me, I got to see tornadoes all the time. And I used to go outside with cameras and start filming a tornado because I was weird. And uh, so just weather in general was exciting to me. And uh, so that's really the number one job I wanted. Um, security forces was kind of cool. Uh, basically, whenever I came, whenever I was still in depth, some kids were coming back from tech school to do their rap 
situation and they're all talking about how cool it was. I'm very happy I didn't get security forces. No disrespect to anyone in security forces, but yeah, they those were pretty much the two main jobs. Past that, yeah, linguists, anything with computers. Yeah, but that's basically what was going on there. I never in a million years wanted to necessarily do maintenance, but here I am. So I ended up joining a six. Uh, for a couple reasons. I was being stupid with my money beforehand and uh, I was in some debt so I looked at joining six because I knew I wasn't gonna get the uh, sign-on bonus but I was at least wanting to be more stable with my life for a little bit longer so I ended up choosing to stay in for six instead so that I can get my life back on track and be debt-free going forward at least from what I was originally going with. Obviously now I have a truck and I have a house so those are some that's good debt in my mind. So yeah, I did a six. I was in a place uh, no one usually wants to go to, Shepard Air Force Base um, in Wichita Falls, Texas. It's about an hour and 30 minutes from where I grew up. Yeah. So our tech schools, um, I'm not sure if this is for every single job out there, but at least for us, your job, uh, your tech school is like split up into two or three schools. Uh, the first one for me was at Shepard Air Force Base. Uh, that alone was about two months roughly. It was from like November to maybe like a month and a half, but basically from like November to January, at least for me, because that's roughly around the time that I graduated basic. As soon as I finished at Shepard, I was shipped off to either McCord or Charleston and they sent me to Charleston. From there, that one was another two months. And then once you get to your job, usually you're on, you're at your work, your job for between three to six months and then they'll send you to your final one. Uh, so basically you have Shepherd, it's called Fundies or Fundamentals, uh, where you learn just basics on each plane or on planes in general. You learn basically how to fill out forms, how to do very simple jobs. As soon as you finish with those, then you go to the other two that I was talking about, at least for me, because I'm a C-17 crew chief. So for us, we went to one of the two. From there, we got more in depth with it. We got to go out onto our actual plane, or if it's raining or something, they just send us into one of the buildings where they have nearly a full-size, at least a simulated plane inside of these buildings. So you can go and mess with the flight deck, see different seats, learn how to go underneath uh, into like a maintenance tunnel underneath like the uh, underneath the floor finally the the last one which is phase two the one that you have uh, basically the one where you're at either Charleston or McCord that one's called phase one uh, but yeah phase two is a last class where they try to basically sign you off on everything to get your five level tech school wasn't awful uh, there's some really stupid stuff at Shepard that pretty much no one liked. I'm not, I don't even think the MTLs really enjoyed it, but it was like basic training was very simple, you know, it, and no disrespect to the MTIs, it was, it was very easy. It was a lot easier than at least I was assuming it was going to be going in. So when I went to Shepard, it just seemed like they are being way too gung-ho about certain things. Like every Friday or so, you go in to the middle of a field and have a dress blues inspection for absolutely no reason. And food was amazing, so I'll say that. Shepard Air Force Base was, uh, if you go there, you'll find out. They have voted like one of the best defects or commas or yeah, just defects in the Air Force when it comes to at least the training bases. So that least, that was the nice part. Uh, my instructor, he was awesome. I, I have nothing but good things to say about him. He was, he was fantastic. So my tech school, at least in Shepard, wasn't awful. My dad died, so I can have a really negative connotation with Shepard with that, but that's not Shepard's fault. When I got to Charleston, oh boy. I've been living in Texas my entire life. I, I spent some time in like Santa Fe, New Mexico, and then a little bit in Washington, D.C. Living on the coast, coming from like the desert, that was amazing. I'm used to just seeing dead grass all the time, and a few trees, and dried up creek beds. And coming out to Charleston, I was... I was feeling like my life was the greatest thing in the world. I get to go out to the beach, which I've barely ever been in my life. There's mountains out here, forests to go hiking in. To me, that was that kind of set it off. My MTLs here were phenomenal. I ended up becoming pretty good friends with one of them. I really can't find anything negative so far to say about Charleston when it comes to on, on the tech school side at all. It was amazing. For C-17, there's basically seven bases stateside. Yeah, there's Charleston, McCord, 
Travis, Elmendorf, Andrews, Dover. There's one more. It starts with an M too. Past that, you have a couple different overseas ones, but once again, it's still pretty small. Uh, it's if I remember, it's Hickam. There's like one more, but uh, yeah, it's like a really really small overseas list. When it comes to how many bases you can get stationed at. Uh, regarding the levels you're at, once you become a seven level in your job, your shred goes away. So the shred is a, uh, basically a letter at the end of your AFSC. So me being two alpha five X one D. D is the shred. You'll learn a little bit more about this during uh, basic training. Once you become a seven level, that shred goes away. So now I'm just I would just be a crew chief. That means I can go into any aircraft that is at least in my field. So being how I'm a heavy aircraft, I would go to, I can go to any of them, C7, uh, C-17, C-130, C-5, um, and yeah, so basically I can go to a lot of different jets at that point. All right, so I'm a, uh, like I mentioned, I'm a crew chief. The jokes we will say is we're Jiffy Lube, basically. So our job is to inspect the aircraft to make sure that it is good to go for another flight or for its mission. Um, so we'll be going out there doing a full inspection, a minor inspection, or a mid-inspection, roughly. At least that's what we do here at my base. Uh, it's called a pre-flight, through-flight, or a BPO. Depending on what kind of inspection you're doing, kind of depends on what's going on there. But so we'll go for a BPO. That is the one that basically is an all-inclusive one that focuses on every single section of the plane. You go out onto the jet, pull up, and you basically do a full inspection, uh, either observing, opening up little tiny doors here and there on everything on the exterior. You're looking at the wheels, make sure that the, uh, the wheels and tires make Make sure that they are still able to be used. Uh, you're checking the brakes, the brake lines, uh, making sure there's nothing that's cut. You're looking for bird strikes, that happens a lot. Yeah, so that's basically like the main things you're going on the inside, looking, making sure everything in the inside is looking good, making sure that upstairs, all the uh, like on all the computers, that everything is good, there's going to be faults that'll pop up, little issues that they're going to claim is something bad. And you basically will go through, look at everything, make sure it's all okay, so all serviceable. Checking fire bottles, fire bottles are like fire extinguishers, um, oxygen masks, first aid kits, uh, making sure the plane has enough oil and hydraulic fluid in a storage bin in the back to make sure that when it flies, if something happens downrange, they have oil and hydraulic fluid to take care of the situation. We change tires, we change different flight surfaces, remove things to either get fixed from a different shop, let's say. Like when we had yesterday, there was a, an issue with one of the panels on the side. I had to take it off. We sent it to a shop called Simcoe. Uh, Kyle probably can explain that one a little bit better. It's sheet metal, so we send it to them. They'll do the inspection or repair on it. If it's cracked, they'll find some way to fix it and then paint it or put a certain like, coating on it to help keep it strong. That's basically our job. Past that, we do launches and recoveries. Launch, you know, you marshal the jet uh, to go fly away, and then when the plane's coming back, marshal it back into your spot. It's not as intimidating as it may look when you first go through it. It's actually pretty fun. Still, everyone else will disagree with me on this one, but it's still my current favorite thing we do as a uh, crew chief. Obviously, inspections are nice because they kill time, but launching and recovering a jet's pretty darn cool, so. That's a funny one. Generally, we're supposed to just work a eight hour shift per day and you work five days a week. But as you'll find out, as a maintainer, that no longer really applies because they can, at least how we do it here at my base, once a week or once a month, you do what's called weekend duty. Super fun. Where you work already four days out of your week, you get one night off, then you come in and do two 12 hour shifts and then one night off and you go back to your, uh, you go finish off the next week. I'd like to say you work 40 hours a week, but sometimes it's 50, 60, just kind of depends on what's going on. I'd say between 40 and 60 on average. Well, you kind of already said the biggest one, uh, AMP license. Yeah, so basically what we can do is we can get an AMP license. It alone is like one of the best things you can get when it comes to being maintenance, especially if you want to do maintenance on the outside. Though a really good option is uh, for me where i'm stationed boeing is here as well so we share the same runway we share the same everything basically so in theory uh let's say what my six years is coming up to an end i'm at my five year mark and i want to get out boeing actually will hire you or me on since i already have the experience and i already know how to use an air force to or 
uh, technical order, I think that's, that's what it means. So since they, their job basically actually follows us. Yeah, I can just sort of start working for Boeing um, without anything, which is nice. Um, now, not all jobs are like that, obviously, but not all bases are have that ability. Just my currently my base is connected to that, so it's very easy for us. You can also go work for airliners. Let's say you wanted to go work for American Airlines or Southwest, you can go straight into it with just the amount of time you've had as an aircraft mechanic, and go start working for them on the civilian side, just fixing their jets when they come in. That, that's basically the main things. You can also get one for uh, like radios isn't bad obviously that means you know how to talk on it like you know how to work a radio for like emergency situations and stuff like that and there are uh, a lot of companies that do want that too so uh, mostly AMP the radio one I was mentioning and just simply just work finding the right company to work for so this one's kind of I would definitely say it's in um, in the middle the people who want to go in appointments they're gone a lot the people who don't want to go in appointments aren't gone it's one of those things where the NCOs or the, the staff sergeants and tech sergeants they definitely try to get on almost every uh, in a uh, deployment that they can. I, I know people that have been here for six years and they have never deployed at all. And I've seen people who volunteer to, to deploy and they deploy several times. It all, it all really depends on how serious you are about deploying. Now, not to say that you're going to get to your base and your base is going to be the same way mine is. Um, I have heard that my base is a little bit different because everyone else on the East Coast pretty much gets the deployment slots before we do. So that's probably why everyone kind of volunteers for them when they can because they know it's not very often that we get to go on them. It just kind of depends on your base. Here at Charleston, yeah, it's not very often, but it does happen a lot. Probably doesn't make as much sense as it does in my head, but we'll get over that. While, let's say, McCord, they're going to deploy to North, uh, to South Korea and all the other uh, bases on the Pacific Rim. So it'll be a little bit different for them because our their staging base is going to be a lot different than ours. Ours were basically getting stationed in Afghanistan, IUD, Qatar, things like that. So it's a little bit different for us versus them. I am undecided currently on if I want to stay in for 20 or just finish my enlistment and get out. It's kind of a, when I joined, right during tech, uh, during basic, during tech school, right when I got to my job, it was 100%, yeah, I want to. Since then, there's been a lot of stupid things that have happened in the Air Force, at least at my base, that kind of possibly pushed me away from wanting to 100% at this point now. Uh, not to say my mind can't change again, but I am coming up to my cross training window. So if I can t change jobs, I will stay. While this job is cool, it has these really enjoyable moments, I'd rather just get a different job that I'll enjoy better. So for me, uh, in about one year, I'm gonna be trying to switch over to what's called a load master. Uh, yeah, so. So I kinda answered that with the last one, but 100% uh, still gonna be weather. Uh, that's never gonna change for me. But I am going to attempt to do load master. That's a not necessarily an exciting job for me, but it's uh, I get to travel the world. I get to do a lot of really cool stuff as a load master. And as a crew chief, while there's some cool stuff you can do, I don't know it's just not as exciting to me as another job possibly could be. So for me, 100% going to try cross training into a different job. If I can get weather, I'm gonna get. I definitely run a request weather. If I can't get weather, I'm not worried about it. Um, I'll, I'll just go, I'll be happy for load master. So those are the two jobs that I really am trying to get into. Uh, the number one thing I would say is do your job correctly, not in like a rude way. Uh, there are literally NCOs and other people who think that they're really good at their jobs that they no longer follow the jobs that are laid out for you. Our job is not very difficult. While it may suck, you have what's called a job guide. And this job guide, it's basically a, a picture book with instructions. It will literally explain it like this. Here's a circuit breaker right here. Pull this one circuit breaker. If you can't figure it out, here's a picture of where it should be. Or let's say you're going to inspect something on the outside or you're trying to remove a panel. You go to that job guide and it will say, remove this panel. 
It has 218 screws. Okay, I'm gonna be here for a while. You see exactly where each one of them are. It tells you how many there are. So luckily, at the end of your job, you can go back and say, okay, I've got 287, not 288 or so. It tells you every single thing that is required of you. If someone is telling you to do it other than the way the job guide tells you to, they are wrong. They are trying to set you up for failure. So do not allow that to happen. There are things you can do around your job that don't necessarily have to do with your job that can help you out as well, especially if you're trying to promote. Some things that are always gonna help is volunteering or doing extra jobs on the side or taking an additional job on the side that takes you away from your current one. It doesn't make as much sense as it does in my head, but I'll give you an example. I just came back from what's called Honor Guard. Now, everyone at your shop is gonna hate you for doing it because they think you're just trying to get out of your job. Really annoying when they do that, especially because you're doing something for the Air Force regardless. That has nothing to do with my job anymore for the X amount of months that you're there, but you're still doing something very humbling and, it, and it's an amazing experience. Like for me, whenever I got to do it, I got to go help these families bury their, their loved one who served in the military either previously or just very recent and uh, give them that last experience with the military that they probably would ever, ever have. That widow or that mother is now going to associate that funeral now with you. And if you do an amazing job, they're now going to be more grateful for the military and for the people that are actually caring about her situation and her family too. It itself is one of my favorite things that I got to do so far in the Air Force. Coming back into my job again, sucky thing is you kind of forget a lot of the stuff you did again. And uh, so you have to go right back to the very beginning, having to learn your job 100% again. So it kind of sucks, but once you get comfortable again, I've, I was like two months ago, I'm already pretty comfortable again with my job. I, I, I understand what I'm doing again. I'm back to being super thorough, and that's pretty much the most important thing. You want to make sure that you're thorough, you know what you're doing, but take opportunities when you get them. While your job only cares about your job, the Air Force cares about what you've done in the Air Force. Honor Guard's gonna help me out whenever I want to apply for, or when I, whenever I want to make Staff Sergeant, or whenever I pretty much do anything. Uh, it's gonna help me out at least temporarily. You now, over time, it's no longer gonna help me because that's old news at some point. Um, now, it'll look good on me going the rest of my career, but not always going to help me out.